Okay, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the first session of our new seminar series. This is the first session of our uh, seminar on Tolkien's Secret Vice. Um, uh, my name is Corey Olson, of course, president of Signum University, and I'm, I, I want to just, just could sort of talk a little bit for a minute about the seminar series as a whole and what it is that we're trying to do here. Um, and I've explained this a couple of times, but I want to make sure that everyone is kind of on board with uh, with with what we're doing. These are new seminars. I've been doing special sessions and stuff through the Mythgard Academy, primarily special teaching sessions that have been open to everybody. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. We wanted to supplement that. We wanted to do a little bit more. Uh, to be able to give more people the opportunity to study with some of the great, uh, you know, writers and scholars and editors, and uh, you know that we've been able to to kind of bring in through Mythgard and Signum uh, over the years. And so we're doing this new seminar series in order to give people those kinds of opportunities. And the the first set of of seminars that I wanted to do is this is my idea um, was to do a series of seminars on Tolkien's new books. Of course, if you're a Tolkien fan, you will have noticed in the last 10 years, there have been a whole bunch of new books that have been released, some material that we've, that Tolkien scholars have been eagerly awaiting for a long time, some uh, new discoveries and, and, and developments on, and new editions of older works that we've had that, but that have uh, uh, nevertheless been, uh, been, been a, a great addition uh, to our understanding of them. So, that's uh, so this and this is our very first uh, of those on the most uh, uh, the most recent uh, of all of these publications and that is uh, J.R.R. Tolkien a secret vice edited by Demetra Femi and Andrew Higgins and so uh, Dr. Femi and Dr. Higgins are both able to uh, to be with us here in this seminar Dr. Higgins whom you can see here on screen with me is um, going to be speaking today uh, Dr. Uh, Femi is going to be speaking next week so that's going to be next Tuesday, the 18th of October, uh, at the same time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. over in the UK, uh, and uh, so uh, so th they're both going to be, and then they'll both be together uh, on, on the following Tuesday, Tuesday the 25th, to do a sort of more general discussion Q and A uh, session with everybody. Um, so that's what's that's what's, so you're going to get a chance to hear uh, about their, the discoveries that they made during the course of, of preparing this edition and all the extra materials here in a secret vice. You know, perhaps you haven't gotten to see the book and you're just wondering what exactly is this book, right? Maybe you've heard of a secret vice, the essay that was you know that that was released in the Monsters and the Critics a while back. You know, it's been sort of in circulation. What's all that? What what is the other stuff in this book? What what things have been discovered and come out? So those you're going to get to learn a lot about a lot of those things, uh, and you'll be able to get to hear that right from the source from uh, from those who are working on it. So I know I'm very excited uh, to hear about this stuff, and I hope that you are too. Now, one last thing that I wanted to talk about before I hand things over to Dr. Higgins. This new seminar series is uh, you know we we, we want to make it open and available to everybody you know anyone can come and join and we're going to have it open uh, the recordings open to be downloaded later on and everything um, but we are asking uh, for a little bit of additional to support support to help to make that possible because it's you know we, we do like to be able to uh, to pay our speakers and of course we, we need to be able to support our programs and everything so we have um We've announced a, a, a suggested donation. Again, it's free and open to everybody. But we do we do ask and 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 suggest that you make a, a twenty or twenty five dollar donation uh, to help to support uh, the series. We're hoping to raise twenty five hundred dollars. We've set a twenty five hundred dollar target uh, for this first seminar that we want to raise in total. And actually, it's been really great so far. Um, we have already raised fifteen hundred dollars out of the twenty five hundred. Uh, that we want to raise. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to to make a donation yet, that you uh, that you will. Um, and I'm going to be uh, posting the link, the donation link. Uh, for this, there's a, a special link that we have to to be able to sort of flag your donation as supporting uh, the Secret Vice Seminar, um, so that we can so that we can see that. Um, and I wanted to to so I, first of all, just of course, to thank everyone who has donated so far. And of course, that we have a a very special thing, which is we have had a very generous anonymous donor. Who contacted me and said he's going to make a matching donation if we reach our $2,500 goal? He's going to make a, another matching donation of another $2,500 on top of that. Um, and so we're $1,000 away from getting our matching funds. So I hope you'll be able to help us get there. We hope to uh, we hope to be able to get the rest of the way through. So uh, um, anyway. 
um, so that's uh, that's 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 where we are. Give some updates about that. Oh, and 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 we also have a a, a special gift. We're going to do a drawing at the end of the the session today. Uh, a drawing among all of the people who have made donations to support the seminar, um, whether it was today or whether it was earlier on. Um, we're going to make it. We're going to. We're. I'm, I'm going to draw the name of one of them, and and you will get a signed copy of a secret vice uh, uh, sent to you by uh, by the editor there. So, uh, so that's that's this is our 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 little gift that we're going to give again to everyone who is who has made a donation to support the seminar. All right, so that's how things are going to work. And without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Higgins. Thank you, Dr. Higgins, for joining us. Thank you, Corey, and, and good e afternoon or good evening, everyone. And um, before I dig into, Cigna, into Secret Vice, I, I just want to echo what, what, what Corey was saying about how incredible, how incredibly exciting this, this fundraising campaign is. And, and in terms of what, in terms of bringing the kind of education that I know we've all enjoyed, and I've been, I've been a member of Mythgard and Signum since the beginning, and I remember the first class I took, which was Tolkien in the Epic, and it was with Tom Shippey, Michael Drought, Corey, and Verlin Flieger, and that was the start, and I think I've taken 16 courses since then. It's an incredible opportunity for people to really dig into these texts, and what the Mythgard Academy does, of course, is offer things for complete free, so anyone can go on and listen to them. Um, I know we're doing Ursula Gwynn's The Dispossessed right now, which I'm getting so much out of. I, I never really explored that text. So please, if you can tonight, let's 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 make that thousand and let's try to go over that thousand goal tonight that Corey talked about. Okay, so we are starting three seminars um, that, as Corey said, myself and my brilliant co-editor, uh, Dr. Dimitri Femi, are going to be doing about this new edition of Tolkien's The Secret Vice. And what I want to do tonight is I think in the process of, of Dimitri and I's working on this volume, uh, we discovered some very interesting things. And tonight, what I'd like to do is start from a very macro kind of approach and look, talk a little bit about the secret vice itself and what, what it's made up of, and then bring that down to probably one of the, certainly for me, the most exciting um, discoveries that were made when, I, when we were working on it, which actually goes all the way back to when I was working on my PhD thesis. And that is a, a certain element that we'll talk about tonight um, of a language that Tolkien most likely invented um, that was included in the Secret Vice talk. So, and what I'll do is I will talk for a bit and then I will stop and I will take questions. So please, um, if you have any questions or anything like that, please type them into the, into the question or the, or the chat, whatever, whatever we're calling it on this interface. Don't wait to ask me your question, you know, type it in and then I'll see them and then I'll stop at a certain point and continue. Um, so I've called this seminar, this first seminar, the language that is spoken in the island of Fonway. And you'll find out what that means in a second. So let's start by looking a little bit at what the secret vice actually is. Um, this book that we published um, is essentially made up of three key chunks of material that exists in what's called Tolkien MS 24 at the Bodleian Library. Um, this is where all of Tolkien's academic papers are deposited. And there's one gray box called MS24 that contains in it a certain number of folders. And in each of those folders are a series of folios that consist of all of the materials relating to the talk that Tolkien gave on a secret vice. First, there is the essay itself. Um, and I've given some of the folios there. And this is written in black ink on what's called Oxford paper. And for those of you who've um, read the history of Middle Earth, you probably have seen Christopher Tolkien mentioning his father writing on Oxford paper several times. This was a type of examination booklet that was used at Oxford, and there were always you know, spare copies, so Tolkien would take them and he would write on them, basically. Um, so a lot of the actual talk of A Secret Vice is written on this paper. Then there is um, the essay on phonetic symbolism, which I'm not going to talk too much about tonight because Dr. Femi, in her seminar um, on Tuesday, the 18th, will be talking a lot about this. And, and, and this is also a very, very exciting discovery, a new piece that no one has ever seen before until we publish this work. And then in the, in the boxes themselves are also a series of manuscripts having to do with notes Tolkien made on A Secret Vice, notes he made on some of the Elvish poetry that he read in the course of The Secret Vice, um, related materials and things like that. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to go to the next slide. 
There we go. So just to give a bit of a background on a secret vice, as I said, it's Tolkien MS24. It's held at the Bodleian Library in Oxford now. As Corey mentioned, it was first published by Christopher Tolkien in 1982 in a volume called The Monsters and the Critics and Other Essays, which were a series of academic essays that J.R.R. Tolkien made, including his one on Beowulf, his one on Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, the valedictory speech he gave when he retired, etc. And when Christopher published that, um, he, noted, uh, he noted in the introduction to it around the dating of when Tolkien was supposed to have given this talk. And Christopher notes, he says, quote, it exists in a single manuscript without date or indication of the occasion of the delivery. And that is very true. There is only one manuscript of the secret vice. Tolkien has made some changes on it, but there's only one version of it handwritten by Tolkien on these Oxford papers. And then he says, Christopher says, but the Esperanto Congress in Oxford referred to at the beginning of the essay as having take place a year or more ago was held in July 1930. And sure enough, Tolkien starts, for those of you who've read the Secret Vice essay, you'll know, he starts it off by saying, some of you may have heard that there was an Esperanto Congress in Oxford. Well, he's referring to an Esperanto Congress that took place in July and August 1930. And as a matter of fact, for Christmas last year, my husband bought me a little stamp from that conference, and this is what it looks like. So this is actually the, con the Esperanto Congress, which has the colors of the Esperanto flag and everything. So we're pretty sure that was kind of a marker when the book was published, when this essay was published, that the, that the talk must have happened around 1931. But no one was actually ever sure of exactly when Tolkien gave this talk or where Tolkien gave this talk. And one of the amazing journeys of the research that Demetra and I did, and, and, and I'm sure Demetra's chuckling to herself right now, is trying to figure out when and where he gave this talk. And we look through lots and lots of minutes of different Oxford societies, of philological societies. We looked at Exeter, we looked at Merton, we, we looked everywhere. And finally, when we were pretty much thinking, oh, we may have to publish this without ever knowing if he gave the talk, because that was another question, did he actually give the talk? Maybe he just wrote it and he never gave it. Um, Finally, we found out through research that Tolkien did give the talk, and he gave it on the 25th, 29th of November, 1931, at 9 p.m., at a meeting of the Samuel Johnson Society in Pembroke College, Oxford. And this is a picture of what Pembroke College looks like today. It hasn't really changed that much. Um, the Samuel Johnson Society was founded in 1871, um, in memory of the author and lexicographer Samuel Johnson. So right away, there's some nice connections with, with language and things like that. And by the early 20th century, as we talk about in the book, um, this society had really become something like a student society, where, which was run by the JCR, the Junior Common Room. And students invited professors who happened to be teaching or were available to come and give papers. And at that time, J.R.R. Tolkien was a fellow of Pembroke College um, as part of his role as Ralston and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, which he had started in 1925. So we that's when the talk was given. And more than that, we also discovered the minutes to the meeting, which is very exciting. I still can remember the day when that happened. It was, I, I was certainly very excited. I don't think my people, my team at work were kind of got when I was running around the hallway saying what we had just discovered, but it was very exciting. And in that minute, it's taken of the Samuel Johnson Society meeting. And this is what it says. In public business, Professor Tolkien read one of the most genius papers that the society had ever heard, The Secret Vice, which gave the paper its title. Turned out to be the study, of, the study and invention of obscure living languages or codes. I like that idea, turned out to be, because I, I often wonder if Tolkien said, oh yeah, I'm going to give a paper on The Secret Vice thinking, well, that'll certainly get the students in. And then when they got there, they found out that actually it was about, you know, language invention and obscure languages and things like that. So maybe the little um, um, teaser of a secret vice thought, hmm, let's go see what that's all about. Um, the minutes continue. After a peculiar conversational opening in which he touched on such elementary new languages as those produced by adaptation of already existing languages, he cited an example, one in which the names of animals were used to denote certain words or phrases, and a whole new language built upon the principle. 
and we'll talk a little bit about what they were talking about there. The minutes continue. Professor Tolkien went on to discuss those languages which were composed of words entirely their own, whether derived phonetically or from some other probably dead language. And then the kicker came. And the kicker came because in the next paragraph of the minutes, an invent a language was mentioned that Tolkien talked about and must have talked about quite extensively because it was remembered in the minutes and is the only invented language mentioned in the minutes, even though, according to the the actual secret advice talk, we know he read poetry from his Quenya and Noldor and Elvish languages. But it says, the most interesting example of the phonetic type of language is that spoken in the island of Fonwe, which apparently has no connection whatever with any other known language, nor is it spoken or understood elsewhere in this one small island. Huh. Well, that, when we saw that, um, it was quite a moment of revelation because all this time, actually, again, going back to, to my work on my PhD thesis, I was aware that within the Secret Vice manuscripts, we were aware in the Secret Vice manuscripts, that there was this page about the Fonway language that had not been included by Christopher Tolkien in the published Secret Vice talk in the Monsters and Mix. So in the manuscript itself, Literally, there is a page, there's a recto and verso, front, front and back, that appears to be part of the original talk. It's not any of the notes that Tolkien wrote later or before. It's in the binding of the, pamp of the Oxford booklet. Um, so it's not a separate note. And these pages are in Tolkien's handwriting. So they do not appear to be, at least from another source, in terms of he found it somewhere and he put it into his talk. This is all handwritten by Tolkien in very, very... Um, shall I say, not the most easiest to read pencil that Demetri and I spent months trying to decipher with two magnifying glasses at the Bodleian Library. Um, and these pages start off by containing a description of Fonwegian, the language that is spoken apparently in the island of Fonwe. There are also instructions on the page to read out certain elements of the language. For example, when he starts looking at, when he starts writing Funwegian words, which we're going to look at in a minute, he writes, read vocab through, which indicates that there was some instruction for him when he was giving the paper to read through the Funwegian vocabulary. Now, fun, the name itself, Funway and Funwegian, only appears, Funway, only appears in one other manuscript in his advice works. And to our current research, in terms of what's available to be seen, we have not yet encountered the word Fonway in any other of, of Tolkien's papers at all. Now, of course, it could be somewhere that we haven't seen, or it could be in Tolkien's private papers somewhere, etc. But so far, the only other place Fonway has appeared is on the manuscripts, um, that third kind of chunk of papers that are in the device papers, um, where Tolkien um, makes a list at the top of the page, and he writes, own corpus, Fonway, underlined, and then this word, Ithai, uh, if Nelson's Goring's on, he could probably correct my pronunciation there because it's Gothic, um, which is the Gothic word for mother. Um, and that's it. Uh, and one of the things that I'm kind of playing around with is I'm wondering if he's here again making a list of some of the invented, of his invented languages. And Ithai could represent a Gothic word in the language that he tried to create based on Gothic called Gautisk which he did around 1910, 1911. That's just a supposition right now. So that's, so two things. So literally by, get, by discovering the minutes, we were able to confirm that Tolkien did indeed talk about this Fonwegian language, which we had discovered about two years earlier. So this, you know, from a research point of view, was like a eureka moment, very, very exciting. Um, I just want to make sure I'm just aware uh, there, I will stop after this slide and, and, and take some questions before we go on. I just want to, before we start digging into Fonwegian, because what I want my talk to really be about tonight is kind of talking about what this Fonwegian language is, how I think it's working within the Secret Vice talk, what Tolkien is attempting to do with it, um, and how we as Tolkien scholars should understand it. And then also, I think there's a lot of room for exploration and discovery, which I think is 
one of the wonderful things about you know when a new work of Tolkien comes out, it gives us another source to really dig into and, and students and scholars to really kind of explore. So I look forward to lots and lots of thoughts about what people think the Fanwegian language is. But I, I started thinking about where does it come within the context of the Secret Vice talk. And I just want to very briefly outline Tolkien's Secret Vice talk. Again, a lot of you, I'm sure, have read it. Um, and for those of you who haven't, this will give you a nice kind of curtain raiser to kind of what the Secret Vice talk is. But of course, he starts off very much with this kind of almost um, halting introduction. You know, he's talking, again, let's remember, this is a student society he's talking to. He's a fellow. He's come there that night. The talk is called The Secret Vice. And he starts off very much by mentioning the Esperanto Congress because he realizes people will probably remember that and it has something to do with invented languages. And for those of you who took the language invention through Tolkien course that, that I taught uh, last year, you know that um, that Dr. Femi actually did some wonderful guest lectures in as well. Esperanto is very much an auxiliary language. It's a language that tries to, is invented to make communication easier, basically. But Tolkien's probably thinking, ah, this is a good way to get into it, basically. But then he quickly, you know, as he says, lets the cat out of the bag and tells people what the real subject of the talk is. And that is this idea of the construction of imaginary languages in full or outlined for entertainment. So this is no longer about language, just being about trying to make communication easier. This is about the art of language invention. And for those of you who have engaged with Tolkien's languages, you know that Tolkien's languages are anything but simple. Um, they're quite complex and they're quite focused on the art and the beauty of the phonetics and the grammar, etc. Um, and then he talks a little bit about the secret practitioners, the people who actually are out there inventing languages that no one knows about, because usually this type of hobby uh, is, is secret. People are, you know, Tolkien himself, you know, when, when he wrote a letter very early on to his then fiance, Edith Bratt, in 1914, he said, I did some more work on my nonsense fairy language, you know, so even he was debating about it. Um, because, you know, to, for those of us who are outside the world of invented languages, it, it is a bit weird, I guess. Um, so he talks about those secret practitioners and about the incredible masterpieces that they're probably creating that no one will ever see or will be the, uh, you know, will wind up in an American museum somewhere with no profit given to the person who invented the language, but to their heirs, which I find funny. Um, and then he gives a very good example of this, and that is this, this, this little man that he encountered in 1915 when he well, supposedly encountered in 1915 when he was um, in military training. Uh, and he was in the middle of a, hearing a lecture about killing people, basically, because he was in training to go to World War I. And this guy said, I shall express the prefix, I shall express the accusative with the prefix. Um, and I'll leave you to read what he says about that because it's quite interesting about um, the act of inventing languages. He talks a little bit about research and actually one of the passages that we've restored in the text in this edition is this passage where he talks about, I give no names, I've done a small amount of research. Um, and we'll look at that passage in a minute. Then he starts to launch into his own biographical or autobiographical experience with language invention. And this goes back to the minutes we looked at. So he starts off by talking about his um, encounter with this um, invented language called animalic, which his two cousins, Mary and Marjorie, in Claydon had invented, and Tolkien and his brother used to go visit them in Bart Green. And this was very much what Tolkien called the replacement language, in that you just took a word in English and you replaced it with an animal name. So you are an ass became donkey 40 or something. You could read in Secret Advice. There was no sense of any relation between the sound and sense of those words. It was basically a code, like kids do. You know, they just make up codes. And then Tolkien himself, got involved with the next stage of that of the Inclidence invented language, and that was called Nevbosch. And Nevbosch was a little closer, because I think Tolkien had his hand in it, a little closer to this idea of playing around with sounds and words. Um, one of the interesting things he points out is that in the limerick that's printed in A Secret Vice, there's the word walk, W-O-C, which means cow, and it's just cow backwards. But it also has a phonetic relation to the French word vache, which means cow. So there's some, some interesting things going on. But again, it was still very much a code that was used for communication, for doggerel, et cetera. Um, so there wasn't that much focus on the sound sense of the language. But the next language, Nafarin, 
was the first one that Tolkien invented on his own. And this language, and he gives a he gives a very frustratingly he gives a passage in Nafrin in a secret vice, but he doesn't bother to translate it. And it's been the uh, the bane and attempt of many of the Tolkien linguists to try to translate it, including me. Um, but Nafrin really starts to show um, the nascent individual element. He starts talking about this idea of Tolkien's fascination with fitting sound and sense together and contemplating the result. And there's some interesting uses of words and phenomes in there. It still has some relation to what Tolkien always refers to in, his, in the Secret Vice as the learnt languages, which for Tolkien was Latin, French, and Spanish mainly. Um, Spanish because Father Francis Morgan, his, his guardian, um, was Anglo-Welsh, uh, so was Spanish-Welsh basically, so he would have encountered that there. So Tolkien talks about Nafrin in the Secret Vice talk, and after Nafrin, it's when he brings in von Wijen, and that's what I want to dig into in the next section. But let's see if we have any questions. So I'm going to click my, oh, lots of questions, okay. Um, so Kate Neville, sorry, this is when I have to take on my glasses. Um, nice and new features, uh, oh, uh, that's, um, Oh, so, so Nancy Forsberg says, "Is this a real place language? Uh, if you if you mean von Wijen and von, I'm going to talk about that in a minute because there's several theories about that. Yes, but we're going to dig into that. Uh, I don't see any more questions so far, so I'm going to I'm going to continue. Corey, let me know if there. Oh wait, one more's coming in. A good source to read more about Tolkien's learned languages experience, especially Spanish." A good source to read more about Tolkien. So, um, there's actually an interesting book um, by, I think it's Oranzo Chili. I, I, I think no, I'm sorry, it's by. Um, I'll get you the name, but it's it's a book, and I don't know if it's been translated into English yet. I think it was in Spanish. That talks a lot about Father Francis and Tolkien. And um, there was also a very good article in Tolkien Studies a couple of years back called Wingless Flutterings, which is all about um, the relationship between Tolkien and Father Francis and kind of the Spanish element and things like that. But I'll, I'll get you that name and maybe we can put that on uh, the discussion board. Okay. If there are no other questions, let's go into, let's kind of figure out what this fun region is and what this fun, this island fun way is all about. So Tolkien introduces it in this way. Here I will interpose some material, which will save this paper from being too autobiographically, autobiographical. I recently became possessed by accident of some secret documents, a grammar and glossary, and some sentences in the fun region language spoken apparently in the island of Fondway. Okay, so when you first, I mean, I mean, I remember the first time I read that sitting in the Bodleian Library with Demetra um, while I was doing my PhD, and one of the first things I thought about was, well, the only analog I can see to this is Norway, Norwegian, Fondway, Fondway. So is there any relation? And I, I, and I did a lot of looking to see, are there any relations in the languages between Norway and Norse and things like that? And there's nothing apparent there. But maybe he's playing around with that idea of the way in the region, which he might have seen in Norway and Norwegian. The other thing, I, I, and this is when I was going over this again, um, and I've been, I've been looking at this a lot again, because there's been some very interesting discussion online, which I will share with you at the end of this, that you, I, I want you all to engage with. And that is, what does possessed mean? That's an interesting word. He didn't say, I recently found or I recently was given. I recently discovered. I recently became possessed. And I, I thought about, just for a minute, some of the ways languages come into work in Tolkien's, um, in Tolkien's mythology. And we just did the Mythgard Academy on the Lost Road. And of course, in the Lost Road, there's this idea of language being received through dreams, you know, you have the father and son, and then of course in the Notion Club papers as well, which he wrote in 1945, you have this idea of people dreaming invented languages, and they come into the meeting and they say, we've got verbs, we've got syntax, etc. So is there something about possessed? Was he possessed in some way? I don't know, I'm just throwing that one out there. Um, the other thing, as I said earlier, is that this is written in the manuscript pages in Tolkien's hand. 
This is not included from another source. Um, so if he did find it from another source, he spent a lot of time copying it over, basically, into these notes. Oops. So did Tolkien find Fun Weijin somewhere? Did he find this? Item? So he. So as I said, we um, we restored this little passage, which was unincluded in the 1982 version of A Secret Vice. Um, where Tolkien said, I give no names. I have made small efforts of research. I use as evidence merely some of the material that sheer chance has brought my way. So I give no names. All one of the persons whose secrets, not in all cases divulge wholly, is dead, but the others are alive. And I put down there just as, anytime I see chance in Tolkien, sheer chance, I always think if chance you call it, you know. Um, that's a very interesting passage, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done, not only on the first part, but on the second part. Who is he talking about? All one of the persons whose secrets, not in all cases divulged wholly, is dead. So someone he knew who invented languages died, but the others are alive. And of course, you know, and, I, and, and, I, and I've done some work on this as well, is he referring to one of the Inklings? Is he referring to Owen Barfield? Is he referring to C.S. Lewis? Again, we don't have any evidence of that. Um, but in terms of the camp of, did Tolkien find Fun Weijin somewhere? This passage does give some support to that, I think. Um, but he's only made small efforts of research, which is interesting. So he didn't do a lot, I mean, he's saying, I did not do a lot of work on this, basically. So what about the name Fun Weijin itself? Well, Again, as I said, there are no notes on these pages about the etymology of the name Fanwe or Fanwegian, and Tolkien's invented lexicons do not include roots or words that shed lights. Believe me, I have been through everything that's been published, and I can't find anything uh, that has any relation to Fan or Fanwegian or anything like that. However, there's a very early Rebus message that Tolkien composed for his guardian, Father Francis Morgan, and this is this is way back when Tolkien was a kid, I and mean, we're talking 1904, um, where he, Tolkien did this very imaginative, and I know a lot of you have probably seen this. Um, you can see it over here. This rebus um, message, Father Francis, which starts, Dear Father Francis, and the cis is a serpent, and things like that. So showing, this is 1904, and it's showing Tolkien already playing around with language and, and visual and stuff like that. Um, but there's also a limerick attached to the message. And the limerick goes, there was an old priest named Francis who was so fond of chi fungi dances that he sat up too late and worried his pate arranging those Frenchified prances. So we have this word chi fungi, which of course doesn't exist a made up word. Um, and when I looked at it, I looked at chi, chi fungi, so, and then I see arranging those Frenchified prances. Could this be cheap Fungi meaning cheap French prances. So does the fun have something to do with French? Again, an interesting idea. And then, of course, is Tolkien inventing fun region? And I think you need to look at Tolkien, how Tolkien thought creatively. Um, and of course, for those of you who've studied Tolkien, you know right away that this idea of creating some kind of narrative framework to introduce a story or a myth was not new to Tolkien, certainly not by 1931. Indeed, in the, in the early Book of Lost Tales, Tolkien created an entire narrative, a narrative framework, the stories of you know, Ariel and Alfwyn and going to the, the Island of the Elves and hearing the tales and transmitting them back, etc., to tell his unique mythology. And of course, this would continue throughout his creative process. You could think of the Red Book of Westermarch and the Lord of the Rings, you know, the fact that the whole Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings were were found manuscripts, basically, in the Notion Club papers. These are papers that were found in 1980, you know, in the future, basically, reporting this, this Notion, all these Notion Club meetings. And for those of you who are very interested in that, I would highly recommend, if you haven't read Verlin Flieger's A Question of Time, Tolkien and Ferry, because he talks a lot about that. But, more, but also, broadly, the found manuscript is also something that is used a lot in the tradition of communicating fictional languages in works of fiction. And I give you two examples here. One is Edward Bullier Lytton's The Coming Race. This is a dystopian tale about a man who falls through a hole 
and finds this kind of weird master race waiting to take over the world called the Vril. And they speak a language called Vrilia. And this structure of this tale is very much what we call a traveler's tale, in that a human being goes from one place to another, encounters strange people, reports on their customs, their laws, their language, etc. And in Bullier Lytton's tale, and again, this is 1871, he includes a whole chapter on the invented language of Rulia, and he goes to great lengths to create a grammar, vocabulary, syntax, etc. It's not integrated into the story, it's just used as kind of a way to create that idea of reality and depth, you know, very much like Tolkien would talk was doing later on. But here again, we have a, a kind of a narrative framework to tell this tale and to tell this language. Another example of this, slightly later, is Percy Gregg's The Zodiac. He goes even further. This is a tale about a Confederate soldier who gets transported to Mars, and on Mars, he learns this entire language called Marshall, and this has to be one of the most complex languages out there. And again, we learn the language through the traveler's tale framework. So again, is Tolkien using this idea of the found manuscript to introduce this language of Fonwijin? Why? Because he's just got done talking very autobiographically about three languages that he's been involved with, and maybe this is his way of kind of deflecting the autobiography a bit and talking about a language that he found. As I'll show in a minute, too, it also very much serves some of the purposes of what Tolkien is trying to illustrate in the use of the Funwegian language. So let's see if we have any questions there. Ooh, lots of questions. Okay. So Mike Neal asks, any progress on the translation of the Nafrin passage. <laughs> yeah, well, there have been um, uh, several attempts. There was a, an attempt very early on by, I think it was Christopher Gilson, um, one, of the talk, one of the, you know, founding Tolkien linguists on a, on a board called Elfing, um, where he, he very much used the premise that Tolkien was using a lot of Spanish because of his, his knowledge of Spanish through Father Francis Morgan. Um, I'm, I did try to do a, tr uh, a translation in my PhD thesis, um, and mine kind of came out about the Nafrines and white ships and things like that, and I immediately thought to myself, I'm being a bit too influenced by knowing what Tolkien would write later on about ships and things like that. Um, so I think there's still work to be done there, and, and, I, and I, I'm, for the book I'm working on um, next, I'm certainly going to take another shot at it. Um, but we don't have a lot of it. The interesting thing is, though, it does start off u o nafrinos. So it sounds like he's addressing someone. Um, and I think it's a fragment of some poetry. Interesting, Tolkien, although Tolkien is often self-deprecatory, he says, I won't translate this for you because it really doesn't mean anything anyway, basically. Um, but I think it does, and that's Tolkien being Tolkien. So more to come there. But if anyone wants to take a shot at it. Um, Caden asks, could he have been referring to the little man, the one who said, I shall express the accusative by a prefect, whom Tolkien said probably did sur didn't did survive the war? Could he have been referring to that? Yes, Tolkien did. I mean, the, in the talk, Tolkien does refer to this little man who, um, oh, are you, are you thinking he's the one who gave Tolkien the fun Ouija hmm. as the one who's dead? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, he only, he says he only encountered him once and then never saw him again, and he kind of wryly says he probably was blown into bits while he was coming up with the subjunctive. So, I don't know how, I mean, personally, and this is only my opinion, I think this is another case of Tolkien, the storyteller, kind of making up a story to kind of help him in this idea, you know, it's, 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 it's this idea of, oh, this guy just happens to be inventing languages. That's an interesting one to look into. I, I don't know how, I don't know if there would have been an opportunity for that kind of um, relationship, but possibly. Yeah, good one. Um, Tom Hillman says, but become possessed of is an expression which has always struck me as similar to the middle voice of ancient Greek, in which the subject of the verb has greater interest or involvement than the active voice would indicate. There's my geeky class observation for today. Oh, Tom, that's brilliant. So he's using the middle I became possessed of idea. Yeah, that, 
Yeah, that's interesting. I love the middle. Yeah. There's a, in a very early version of the Quenya verb that uses a middle as well. So Tolkien definitely knew his, knew his Greek. Um, good one. Okay, let's take one more. Um, Mary Prosser says, I'm oh, sorry, Marie, sorry, Marie. Prosser says, I have to assume that Tolkien misheard what the little man said, and it was probably unrelated to invented languages after all. Well, although he does say quite clearly that he overheard him say, I shall express the prefix, the accusative with a prefix. And he goes on to basically say not it is expressed or it should be expressed or one has to learn it is expressed, but I shall. I shall make the decision as a language inventor that the accusative will be expressed with a prefix. That is the magic of language invention. You are determining, you are making that rule. And I think that's what Tolkien was quite impressed with. Okay, let's press on and we can, we can go back to the question in a minute. So let's think a little, let's talk a little bit about the context of Funwegian. What Tolkien is attempting to do by bringing it up. And as I said, I think he, he, it comes right after Nafrin. And one of the points Tolkien makes about Nafrin, again, as I said, it's still being influenced by learned languages. So you can see elements of English, Latin, and Spanish. So for example, there's the, uh, the Nafrinos Kuta. Kuta uh, clearly comes from Kuta, which is a Latin verb to mean um, are going or leaving or something like that. So you, there are some things. There's also one word that is that Tolkien does translate um, which is a very interesting word, vru, F-R-U, um, which means ever, always, constant. And this is a word that you can actually trace throughout Tolkien's language invention. Uh, it comes into Elvish as voro, which means um, ever or steadfast, and it forms the name of Varanwe, who in the original mythology was, was Eriendil's wife and then became Eriendil's companion, steadfast companion. Later on, through several more of the conceptual versions of the language, it becomes boar, um, again, uh, in Noldor and boar, which gets jo joined with mir, and you get boromir, which means steadfast jewel, which is, I always think, a bit ironic, given the character of boromir. So from, you could, there are a couple of cases where Tolkien just fell in love with a certain type of word form, and he would continue it through, you would, it just pops up, lint is another one, L-I-N-T, which comes from nevbosh and actually means quick or, uh, quick or um, rapid. And we, that becomes Tinwe Linto. And then later on, there's a poem called, in which there are characters called the Lintips. So he, he, liked, he had a predilection for certain kinds of sounds and words that he liked to use over and over again. Um, so besides this idea of being influenced by learned languages, as I mentioned, there's this nascent element. And this is this idea of the construction of words that deliberately attempt in their invention to not reflect a direct or overt relationship to a primary world language. So let's try to create a word that has no relation to a primary world language. Very tricky because you're dealing with lots and lots of different languages here. And one of the interesting things that Tolkien makes, a good point Tolkien makes here, he says and in, in doing this and attempting to create this individual, and that's Kind of the word he uses a lot is individual. Um, you don't necessarily have to make it look so alien. And I think back here to if you read lots of 1950s and 1960s kind of science fiction or some of the pulp magazines or things like that, you know, the aliens always have these really weird names like X, and you can't even pronounce them, where people use lots of X's and Z's. Ursula Guin has a great preface uh, in the Encyclopedia of, of um, uh, Invented Languages which is a great, great resource, and she talks about that, that, you know, why is it that every alien has to have six X's in their name and stuff like that? Tolkien was saying there's a way of doing this without going to that thing, so that to invent <clears throat> is unique, but it's built upon kind of the building blocks of language. Sorry, let me take a tea break. <clears throat> and he gives us an, as an example of this, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this idea that he suggests that you can create alien word forms by simply playing around with the phonetic elements of primary word languages. He says, 
It is much in habitual sequences and combinations as in individual phenomes or sound units that a language or language maker expresses its peculiarity. And he changed that in the manuscript to achieves individuality. So what he's saying is you can take a primary word and you could play around with the, the phonetic structure of it and you can invent something that looks quite foreign or individual. And he takes as an example of this, take the word scratch and write it backwards phonetically. So first of all, you have to turn it into its phonetic parts. So scratch, so the C would become a K, for example, and the A would become an AE because it's a diphthong, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, and then turn it around backwards and see what you get. So you get this very strange word, Starks, S-T-A-E-R-K-S. Again, he says, each phenome being perfectly native, but the total entirely foreign. So you have now created a word. You've invented a word that looks individual, but is based on the building blocks of a primary world language. Thus, when someone looks at it, it doesn't look so alien as using 25 X's and Y's and Z's. And this is where von Weijin comes in. So he says, now this specimen, though much less sophisticated in some ways than Nafrin, deserves to be placed after it as being higher because it is more original. So von Weijin has elements of this idea of using primary world language, but playing around with it phonetically. And I think here we start to see a bit of a up for the argument that Tolkien is inventing Funwegian, because the way Funwegian is being used in, in the talk is illustrative of what Tolkien is trying to talk about here. So, oops. Um, so as I said, he brings it in as his example. So he says, and he's talking about Funwegian now. So this is what he read out when he was talking about Funwegian in 1931 to these students. Dependent as it is for the scheme of its grammar on the learned languages like Latin and French, both its phonetic evidence and its mechanism is peculiar, sorry, that should be is, is peculiar and individual and appears to owe nothing to English, French, or Latin. It clearly illustrates my point about Starks above. Its sounds are English, its grammar largely Latin, but it remains individual. So he's trying to make, he's making that point that what you can do is you could take that primary oral language, play with it, and make something that's individual. But the first point he makes is when you look at the fun Weijin grammar, and as he said in the introduction, he found elements of grammar. Um, and this is what he reports. So, and we, we reproduce this in the book. So what he gives, and again, um, as Dimitri knows, uh, the uh, deciphering of this was quite intense. This is, this, is, this is a very small pencil on a page, basically. Uh, but we got there after many, many sessions. Um, he first gives a series of pronouns. Now, interestingly, Tolkien was very interested in pronouns. There's one area of Tolkienian linguistics that I think remains to really be dug into is the different conceptual versions of Tolkien's pronouns from the earliest versions of his Elvish languages all the way up to the stuff he was writing at the end of his life. He was fascinated by pronouns. They, they start out as prefixes, they become suffixes, they become infixes. He just reveled in the whole idea of pronouns. Um, so what does he give here? He gives some pronouns. So he gives the pronouns for I, so that's ib, and then underneath we, immer, then you get you, singular, no, you plural, no here, and then he gives he, she, and it, won, wone, and wonos, that's, and he writes neuter there, so we know that's, that's it. And then he gives three plural forms, woner, wonere, wonaser. Notice the interesting um, change in the neuter, where the O and the S stay, whereas in the other ones, you just have the endings. So he's doing something interesting there. So that's Plural all he, plural all she, and plural um, he, she, it, basically. So there's a mixture there. Um, well, this is looking very, very like Latin, isn't it? I mean, you know, you think of ego and tu and hic, hic, coke and all that kind of stuff. It's The structure looks very like learned languages that Tolkien would have been learning. Um, but the words are different. 
And then we get this little declension. And again, he doesn't decline what Khan means, unfortunately, um, but he just says, thus Khan making, and then he gives a little declension. So he's giving the nominative of the masculine, the feminine, and the neuter. So this definitely has to be um, some kind of adjective, possibly, um, because he's giving masculine, feminine, and neuter. So we get con, cane, conos. Then he's giving the genitive form, conis, conisi, conosis. Then he's giving the nominative plural, conair, conary, conoser. So see how the o stays. And then he gives the, um, the, the genitive plural. It doesn't say genitive plural, so we're assuming because he gave the genitive singular and because all he's basically doing is adding um, uh, on to the genitive, uh, but that's not definite, conaris, conarisi, and conoceris. So we're given some declension here. We're, told, we're not told what this word means, but as you can see, it's a fairly simple structure uh, of what's called an agglutinative language where you take a base root and you add endings to it. And of course, for Tolkien, this is the way Tolkien invented many of his languages, starting with the Quenya lexicon when he had a series of base roots that he would add suffixes and prefixes onto. So we're, you know, we're seeing that structure here. Also, thanks to Dr. Nelson Goring, I don't know if he's on tonight, but one of the things he pointed out in one of the um, chat rooms about Supervise was that the use of the, uh, the ER to make a plural is something Tolkien would very much do in the Elvish languages. So, um, Lantar, Lantar, uh, Lowry, Lowry. There are examples where he uses the R at the end to make plural. So we're, we're seeing that. So possibly the early influence of that. So some of the things Tolkien talks about, about Fumwegian here, is that the agglutinative idea is attained by a maker who has no practical experience in making but inflected languages. So what he's saying there is the guy who made this language only knew about inflected languages, and that's why it has inflections. And the invention, the association of sound and symbol, and says is singular free from pressure of tradition. So while the structure is very much learned languages, the words themselves are not. The words are unique. Practically nowhere can one perceive the association implied by English, French, or Latin directly by choice. Thus in grammar, is genitive is sole example, and that very differently employed. So he is making one concession. He's saying that is in the genitive is very much like a third declension, rex regis, for example, in Latin, where you have the king, rex regis, of the king. So there is something there. But for the most part, it is very unique. And this uniqueness is further, and here again, Fanwegian is being used to make a point. Um, he specifically emphasizes this by first saying that he, in the found glossary, this glossary that he found, there were 250 Fanwegian words. Did he read all those out? Because he says read vocabulary through. I can't imagine the students would have sat there and listened to him read out 250 Funwegian words. And there, and there aren't 250 Funwegian words in the notes. But if he had another list or something that doesn't exist, I don't know. But I think that would have probably taxed the students, especially because there was more Elvish to come later on as well. Um, but he, he makes the point first, and, and, and a bit annoyingly, um, that some Fanwegian words do have a derivative sound to them, that they do resemble the primary world languages. And that's these words. And these, again, are very, they're written across a page in very light pencil. Uh, it was quite fun to translate these. Um, but we get words like ak, which is and or both. So if you know your Latin, you know that that's a, a way of saying and. Mo more, death. Agrul, field. We'll think of agar in Latin. Epish, letter, epistle. Amosa, love. Amo, amas, amat. Pase, peace. Well, it sounds like peace. Regenensi, queen. Now see, sailor. Pen, foot. Lauka, praise. So think of the first declension, first conjugation, laudo, and asadat. Rogis, red. Glaupsi, sword. Uh, gladius, for example, in Latin. Usit, useful. And vase, voice. So these all, if you were to look at them, you'd go, oh, yeah, I can, I can kind of figure out what that means because they look like a Latin word or an English word, etc. So he's, he's first dismissing, he's almost dismissing that. Saying, These are the ones that have derivative meaning, basically. And then he goes on to say, but there are other Fonwegian words um, which he just 
which he characterizes as derivative. He says, yes, these are derivative, but they do not show any overt primary word sources. And these, and again, these are, again, up for analysis and interpretation, include these words. And there's recently been a question about one of the words um, by um, one of the people who's kind of been looking into this, Edmund Wiener, who's one of the editors of, of The Ring of Words, that brilliant book about Tolkien and the Oxford Dictionary. And he, he asked if maybe Cap Hills are two words, and Tolkien's really writing Cap, and it means hill. Well, I look back at the manuscript and know it's one word, and it's underlined. And what Tolkien does is he underlines all of these words, basically. So if it is a Funwegian word, it's underlined. So it is one word, capital. Um, and then we get these other mystery words, toxtos, the poem, P-O-N-B means girl, dubu means many, male means mother, pagos means father, pulfuga means plow, kind of sounds like a plow. Uh, ruxa means nose, and teplos means time. So according to Tolkien, these had derivative meanings, um, but we don't know what they are. And then finally, and unfortunately we don't get a lot of them, I wish he'd spent more time telling us about the Funwegian words, we get a whole series of words that are proper Funwegian words. Um, and these are them. Um, and I won't read them all out, but just have a look at them and, and you can see basically, there are some interesting um, patterns and things like that that I will show you. Um, one of them are trisyllabic words. So for example, you get, Weg o lang, which means good. Tell a brief, which means conqueror, etc. There's also a series of words that end in this LLA. Oh, I can use the pencil. Oh, I like that. The LLA, for example, you get Hugwala, which means the guard. Huntilla. I always think of Hun for that, meaning despise. You know, you think of the Huns, the Germans, and stuff like that. Maybe there's something there. Fanwella, which means attack. We also have words that are formed from base roots. Again, something to, something that Tolkien would very much do with his Elvish language. So you have fon logos. Well, logos, of course, suggests the word word. So is a fon logos uh, a word of fon, which is a book? Who knows? We don't have enough of it to really know. Fon wella, again. So something about fon being a base root to which wella is added. Um, as I mentioned, the use of the ER, which Dr. Goring pointed out. Um, another interesting thing uh, is Tolkien makes a very specific point of saying that there's an absence of onomatopoeia, um, which is, of course, as Tolkien would say in his essay on phonetic symbolism, which Dr. Feeney will talk about in the next session, it, this is the imitation of physical sounds with, um, with organs of speech. So think of onomatopoeic words, words that sound um, you know, whoosh and things like that. And, he, and in Famuijin, apparently there is an absence of that. So you, he cites this word kaya, meaning sing. Well, there's no sense of singing in the sound of kablea and pindula in laugh. So that's an interesting point he makes. Um, and Tolkien himself admits, in this moderate effort, whose moderate effort? In this moderate effort, it is difficult to state what this specific character is, and what the Funwegianness is therein. And Tolkien was very interested in this idea in terms of languages. What makes an element of language that language? What is the Greekness of Greek? What is the Gothicness of Gothic? Gothic? What is the Funwegianness of Funwegian? And the other thing that, you know, he said right up front, I found some Funwegian sentences. Well, he doesn't give us any Funwegian sentences, um, which he appears to have found. So we don't get any idea of how the grammar and the syntax of Funwegian words, we get an example of the morphology through the names and the, and the little elements of grammar. But he doesn't put them together, or we, or we don't get that. OK, I'm going to stop and take some more questions. And then I'm going to suggest a possible reason why Tolkien is also bringing this up in the bigger context of his talk. So let's see what questions we had. Uh, Miss Neal asks, is it significant that Fungwegian was used on an island? Ah, good one. Yeah, I think it was. I think it's interesting that it is on an island because, you know, think of, um, and I'm going to cover this in a minute, I think 
one of the things we see in the history of language invention up to Tolkien is this idea of the traveler's tale. It, it's very convenient for someone writing fiction, basically, to have someone go from one place, go to an isolated island, meet a group of people who are speaking some strange language. And of course, this very much mirrors the kind of the exploration and discovery that happened first in the Middle Ages when people went off to the Crusades and came back with all kinds of fantastic stories. And then in the Renaissance, when people started exploring the New World, and you know they go to the New World and then encounter a people and they come back and record it, this is very much mirrored in the fictional works as well. And as more and more places got discovered, the Traveler's Tale started expanding underground. So you have an example of like Bullier Lytton's Vrilia, where the traveler goes underground. And you also have people going up in space, like Percy Gregg's uh, Marshall across the, the Zodiac. So there's something about the fact that it is spoken only in the island of Fonway. There is also an, a, an example of language invention, and of, an, of an invented language that was created by, we don't know his real name, but he called himself George Salamanzar. And he claimed to be from Formosa, um, the island of Formosa, which of course is now Taiwan. And he claimed, um, he wrote this entire book, basically inventing from Formosan culture, including a Formosan language. And he wrote the Lord's Prayer in it and things like that. And, and, he, was, this was, and he was doing quite well. He actually started a whole trade in Formosan fans, very craftily divine, uh, designed Formosan fans until Sir Edmund Haley, the guy the, of whom the common is named, basically debunked the whole thing. And he was also supposedly a friend of Samuel Johnson. So when, I was, when we were talking about this, I was wondering, is, is Tolkien paying a bit of an homage to that, for example, for making it Famosa Fonwegian? Possibly. Um, but there's another example of language invention that I will cover in the next section, which I think might also help answer that question. Um, uh, Marie Prosser says, right, Maya, Mayar, Valar, Valar, Finn. Yeah, exactly. So there are many examples in Tolkien's Elvish languages of the R being used as the plural marker. Exactly, yes. Um, Kimber Nelson asks, from developing Fomwesian and other pre secret vice languages, what do you think Tolkien learned about how to successfully create languages that he carried into his later life developing languages in Middle Earth? Very good question, and I'm going to kind of, in my sum up, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, because I think what we're seeing in Tolkien's review of these autobiographical experiences of languages is Tolkien learning how language invention should work in, in fiction, which, of course, the Lord of the Rings and, and all of his mythology would be incredible examples of. So hold on, hold on to that. I will answer that question. Okay. So I mentioned... Um, we talked a little bit about and things like that. And I think it's in the next section of, um, it's 10, 10 06. I'm just um, working on, I told Corey I had lots of slides, so, but I'm getting through them. Um, in the next, after Tolkien talks about Fumwijin, he makes a very interesting comment. And I think this kind of wraps it up and shows us where Tolkien was thinking in terms of bringing in Fumwijin. And that is that he says, the whole, that is the Fonwegian language, is slightly reminiscent, in fact, of the Swiftian characters as seen in Scraps, scraps Thou Shaped, of the Lilliputian, Lufuscadidan, and Broadingan idioms. And I always destroy, I had, to give, I had to give a paper at Kalamazoo this year, and I totally destroyed those two names. So I need to work on my Swift pronunciation. And of course, what Tolkien is referring to here is probably the granddaddy of language invention. Um, at least up to the time of Tolkien, and probably for the students sitting there listening to this paper, the most well-known language inventor. And that, of course, was Jonathan Swift, uh, who was an Anglo-Irish author and, and satirist who wrote Gulliver's Travels. And Gulliver's Travels is the, is the quintessential traveler's tale about Lemuel Gulliver, a ship's cook, who has a very bad luck on lots of the voyages he goes on because he always winds up shipwrecked somewhere. And he encounters all kinds of different people, some larger than him, some smaller than him. And of course, Swift was a great satirist and he was using this to sat satirize a lot of different cultures. But one of the key things that Swift did is that he used language invention to create the reality of the people 
that he was uh, having a Gulliver encounter. And not only did he use language invention, he used different elements of sounds of languages to distinguish different people. And this, of course, is quite interesting to Tolkien, who was very much focused on this idea of the sound of languages. So he, he mentions this mention. And then in the, um, in the papers of the secret vice in the, in the, in the MS-24 that we reproduced in the book, Tolkien made a list of names from Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Um, that's on pages 85 and 86 of the book, where he literally listed out the Lilliputian names, the Blue Fiskadoon names, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through. So Tolkien was very interested in these names. And these notes show how he was very interested in the sound pattern. So for example, he makes a note that Swift you tended to use the clusters GL, GR, and LG to distinguish the broad Dean people from the Lilliput. So the Lilliput are when Gulliver, of course, is big and the Lilliputians are small. And then on the next island, Gulliver is small and all the people are big. So Swift plays around with the use of different elements of sound to create that sense between the small people and the big people. And so we get this bird for Gulliver on the island where everyone's big, grill drink, which means little man. Um, and one of the things that, um, sorry, sorry. Um, I just want to give you some examples of Swift's language inventions just so you can see that. So for example, in Lilliput, on, on the island of Lilliput, Gulliver is made to swear an oath to the king. And the oath is Lumos Kelman Peso Desmar Lon Emposo, which is swear a peace with him and his kingdom. So there's lots of uses of vowels, lumos, kelmen, peso, ends in an O, et cetera. Compare that later on in one of his third voyages when he goes to the island of the sorcerers, which are these very mystical people, sorcerers who can conjure up all kinds of things. And he has to address the king again. And this is the, and I'm, this is very hard to pronounce, but ink pling glothrig scoot. Serum bithlog mlashnat zvin dhanadnasa shivopad groda ash. I don't know why I made it sound Russian, but there you go. May your celestial majesty outlive the sun, 11 moons and a half. Now, Swift doesn't go to the trouble of giving us all the grammar for Lilliputian or for the island of the sorcerers. He just throws these words out on the page. But what he's doing is he's using different combinations of vowels and consonants to create different senses of these different people. Another example on the island of the sorcerers is Fluftrim Yalrik Dwoldum Prastrad Mirpush. God, why am I sounding Russian when I go? My tongue is in the mouth of my friend. Interesting one. And then uh, Gulliver's last voyage goes to the island of the Hunim. And the Hunim are speaking horses. And there's a lot of satire going here. But they have a they have a language that's very much sounds like the whinny of a horse. Huni ilya nya yahoo, which means take care of thyself, gentle yahoo. A yahoo, it's not the search engine. It's it's um, anyone who's not a hunim, basically. Hunim means perfection. So these are horses that think a lot of themselves. Um, Tolkien wasn't very impressed with the Hunim language. He felt it was a bit of an eye joke. Um, but but you can see in each of these examples. Swift using different elements of sound to distinguish different people. So Tolkien was kind of convinced by this, but he wasn't completely convinced. And in, in, in the comments, uh, when he's talking about the Swiftian nature of von Weijen, he says, Swift made some effort to differentiate the Lilliput type from the broad but while one would, But while one would, unless one knew their Gulliver by heart, which would not really prove anything, not be able unerringly to assign many words to pygmy or giant. A general Swiftian character pervades all the whole. So what Tolkien is saying there is Swift tried to do it. He tried to create this distinguishing thing. But again, because he didn't really focus on the structure of the language and how the language works in the text, it would be very tricky to distinguish between a Lilliputian word and a broad Budingan word. And of course, we know that in 1937, um, when Tolkien gave some of his um, manuscripts <clears throat> to Alan and Unwin to be read, 
and this was after The Hobbit, and they were clamoring for more information. Um, they were clamoring to publish something else because The Hobbit was so successful. <clears throat> and Tolkien submitted lots of stuff, including the sketch of the mythology and um, several, well, several things, and some of his mythology, and it came back with a note saying that um, there were lots of eye-splitting Celtic names, one of the reviewers said. I think it was Crookshank, I think his name was. And Tolkien wrote back saying that um, he stated to his publishers that his own elvish name invention was coherent and consistent because they were based upon his two related linguistic formulae. Um, which achieves reality and an illusion of historicity that was not fully achieved by any other name inventors such as Swift or Dunsany. Dunsany, of course, is Lord Dunsany who wrote things like the Book of Wonder, um, uh, stuff like that, that used very interesting uses of names, um, but again, didn't have any real structure behind it. The Gods of Pagana, for example, things like that. <clears throat> so Tolkien thought that Swift had started towards that. But of course, someone just asked me, what did Tolkien really learn through all of uh, this kind of encounter with language invention? And I would say, and I think this kind of sums it up, um, <clears throat> Tolkien believed that there are four characteristics of art languages and how, how invented languages should work in fiction. One of them is this idea of the creation of word forms that sound aesthetically pleasing, or at least have some aesthetic, aesthetic sound to it, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're all sounding beautiful, but there should be an aesthetic sense to it. So, for example, it's the difference between, between if you didn't even know what they meant, the two phrases, I lari lanti lasi suin, versus ash nas debatical, ash nas gimbatul. Even if you didn't know that one was Quenya and was spoken by the elves, and the other one was the black speech from the ring inscription on the ring, you would get some sense that one was probably a bit more nicer than the other, with all those kind of, you know, I, lari, lanti, lasi, suirini, this kind of openness. Now, of course, the, the caveat to this is always, you know, who's listening to that language? And I, and I think one of the interesting things about <clears throat> this idea of sound symbolism that Dr. Femi will be talking a bit more about is this idea of perception of those different sounds among different people. But certainly from a Western audience, I think you get that sense that the long vowels have a, have a nicer sound to them and everything. Another related thing to that idea is the sense of fitness between the symbol, the word form, and its sound and its sense. So words should sound the way they mean, basically. They should, there should be a meaning to them. The third is the construction of elaborate and complex grammars. So again, unlike Swift, Tolkien believed that an invented word, an invented sentence of an invented language should not just be made randomly. There should be a coherence and a consistency based on a grammatical, an invented grammatical structure. And for those of you who have studied Tolkien's languages, you know that Tolkien put incredible focus throughout the, his entire life on the development of these, of these complex grammars, word lists, that you know, we have many conceptual versions of a Quenya grammar or a Sindarin grammar, etc. So there should be a structure. And then finally, and I think this is what he really learned when he took language invention from it being among people in a social group, and he started privately inventing uh, invented languages, and that is that a language has to have a story and a mythology. The composition of a f fictional historic background for an invented language. Tolkien believed, as we, you know, <clears throat> this idea that mythology and language and languages and mythology, the mind, the tongue, and the tail are one. You can't have an invented language without it saying something, without having someone to speak it, and those people have to have a story, they have to have a mythology. And I think if there's one thing that Tolkien certainly took out of his early development of invented languages is this idea of these two things, and as he says, they are coeval, they are interrelated, they, do, you know, they cannot be separated apart. And for those of you who've studied Tolkien, you know that. You know that, you know, language and myth go together in Tolkien. Um, so if we look at von Weijin, I would say that von Weijin is a good example of these four key characteristics coming out. So for example, as we've reviewed, as we've seen, the sound aesthetics of von Weijin, that it does have, although we're not quite sure what Tolkien's whole intention was of von Weijin, 
it does have a certain sound sense. Um, it focuses on a, a sound nature. It's original, but Tolkien had an idea of what these words should be sounding like. So as he says, um, and even here, the best results are achieved by making a language in which the sounds do mean something, though only perhaps to the author. So again, we don't have enough of it, and we don't know what was in, in Tolkien's head, but there was a certain sound sense to it. Um, sorry about that. Um, system of grammar. Well, again, we've seen elements of grammar for Fumwegian. Again, we don't get sentences, as Tolkien reports finding, but we get elements of grammar. They're modeled very much on Latin and French, but forming words with a unique element. And the constructions of elaborate and ingenious grammars, as I said, would be a key part of Tolkien's lifelong work on his legendarium. And as we, and for those of us who you know dig into these incredible documents, you can see that Tolkien's interest was not necessarily in putting together in creating one grammar, but would really reflected what Tolkien was thinking at different conceptual periods of the development of the mythology. So as he says, the the languages shift; they change. There's not one unified language, as many people have tried to establish. And then finally this idea of myth and language. So directly, at, it's, I think it's interesting that directly after introducing Fun Weijin, he says, as a suggestion, he's talking to the students now, as a suggestion, I might fling out the fact that for perfect construction of an art language, it is found necessary to construct at least, at least in, uh, in kind of outline, a mythology concomitant. Your language construction will breed a mythology. And I challenge any of you guys who are out there inventing your languages. A mythology will always come out of an invented language. You always have to have, you know, what are they going to talk about? Who are they going to talk about? Who are these people? What are their story? What are their background, etc.? cetera? Um, of course, nowadays that, that has shifted a bit where we have people who, you know, there's the conlang association where people just invent languages to invent languages. But even there, if you, if you dig into some of those invented languages, as I've done, there are elements of mythology and story. And I think there's a fascinating work that could be done about looking at what mythology emerges from some of those projects on invented languages. Um, and one new note that we've restored in this edition, which comes from a note Tolkien made um, from one of the uh, drafts of the secret vice in the back, one must construct also a verse and a mythology, or one's masterpiece is incomplete. The masterpiece, of course, is the language invention. So again, myth and language. So to conclude, I leave you with these questions. What is Fonwegian? Is it a fragment of an invented language by Tolkien, which he used to illustrate his point about invented words being formed in unique but not alien ways? Is it a ludic intertextual interlude on the invented languages of Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels? one of the few well-known inventors of language for fiction? Is it an attempt by Tolkien to introduce another invented language made by him by using the found manuscript topos to move it away from the autobiographical nature of the other invented languages he was exploring? Is it an invented language Tolkien found in the, quote, small efforts of research he did for the paper? And if so, where and by whom? And there's a very interesting debate going on right now, and I've given you, and, I, and I'm sure we could probably post this um, wherever we post this on this new system. Um, there's a great current debate going on. Uh, there's the Secret Vice Forum in the wonderful uh, Lord of the Rings Plaza.com, which has some amazing, um, really good debates going on, academic debates and things like that. And then, um, Ed, as I said, Edmund Wiener, who's one of the co-editors of the beautiful, uh, the brilliant Ring of Words. Um, you know, he's, 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 he's doubted me a bit on this. He said, well, I, I think maybe he did find it. So he's, he's got some good blog posts going on there, which I, 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 um, I think you should read and, and have a look at. And then I say, you know, read the book, debate and discuss. We'd love to hear what you think. We, you know, one of the great things about research and scholarship is putting this stuff out there and telling people what we think it is, but then we want people to discuss and debate. And now that We've had this great opportunity, very much thanks to the Tolkien estate and HarperCollins to bring out another big chunk of Tolkien's work. And, and there's more to come with Merlin Flieger's new book coming out next month. This just gives scholars and students an opportunity to dig even more into Tolkien. So I would say keep digging and, um, 
and then let, let's see if there's any questions. Thanks very much. Okay, let's see. Uh, Caden asks, I agree with Tolkien on that. For natural language, language is heavily influenced by the culture, including the mythology of the people who speak it. Um, therefore, in order to make an invented language seem real, a mythology is needed, which must also have a visual effect on the language, yes. Also, as Tolkien said, I think that as you invent a language, it will begin to create a mythology. Absolutely, Kate, and I agree. Um, I think, you, you know, and, and, you know, I go back to that, you know, the, tongue, the mind, the tongue, and the tail are co-evolved, you know, that they're all joined together. Dr. Feeney says, just to add my two pennies, hi, Demetra. The notes on from region are definitely in Tolkien's handwriting, and if he found it from somewhere else, why invent the entire island of Fonway fiction? Yes, I agree. I think uh, it just, it, it, I mean, again, it seems odd to me that he would go all through all of that. And also, you know, I think that this idea of the points he's making with Von Weijin, it would have been very convenient to find an invented language that helped you make all the points you wanted to make. It just seems like it's serving too many of the ideas that he's, and that's why I think it's important to dig into that passage before him when he's talking about scratch and sterics and creating a unique, um, an individual thing. It kind of serves that whole purpose. Um, Stephen Hawley, no questions, just a big thank you, very informative. Well, if it was informative, and I, and I hope it was, I, again, um, I urge you all to, you know, show your, show your thanks and show your support by making that goal tonight so we can get that matching money in. I think that would be great. Uh, Kimber Nelson, thank you for your scholarship and sharing with us. Oh, thank, thank you, Kimber. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you so much, Andy. I got through all my slides, Corey. I knew you were going to brag about that. See, here's Andy. He's like, I got 38 slides. I can do that in an hour and a half. No problem. I know. I know. I know. You, to <clears throat> you totally doubled my, my like, slide total. I, I, it's, it's all good. Um, I cannot compare to your close reading acumen, Corey. So, you know. <laughs> well, you know, or just, like, slowness of movement but it's all good um well i have uh, uh at first I, I just wanted to comment on on how wonderful this is i was especially struck by the, that moment when you're talking about the day that you guys discovered the um the, the the minutes right with the record of 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 you know of tolkien's uh, talk and um and which because it's awesome right it's not, it's not just like a stray reference right that proves that it was there and then but that whole that you know the the, the minutes with the comments and the and i mean that's just this is gold right there, and uh, yeah, it's so so exciting. But I but I also totally relate to that the experience you were describing of of like your coworkers at Glyndebourne wondering like what the big, I mean it's kind of it's 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 a, it's a really exciting thing, but it's it's uh, it's it's sort of uh, you know geeky on such a high level that it's really hard to to convey <laughs> to people. My geekiness, believe me, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really does kind of put you in a new category, but that's uh, that's just fantastic. It's just it's just wonderful. Um, uh, well, I have I do have an update, a very exciting update, in fact, that um, uh, we have during the course of the session here today, we received sixteen hundred and fifty three dollars in additional donations. So we have in fact surpassed our goal today and gotten the matching funds. Yeah. So now with the money we'd raised before, the money we raised today, and the matching funds that now came in, we are now over $5,500 towards the whole seminar series on the whole for the year. And that's fantastic. Our initial goal was to raise $2,500 uh, for this seminar. Our annual goal, for, well, we because I said we're going to do at least five, maybe six seminars over the course of the year, uh, we'd like to raise at least $15,000 over the course of the whole year to support the entire series. Um, so we're we're now a third of the way towards the entire annual goal, which is uh, which is really really wonderful. Keep giving, great. Sorry, I'm a fundraiser. You know. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So thank you guys so much uh, for your generosity today. Uh, uh, just a, a bunch of wonderful gifts, and I did I did do uh, do the drawing just now, uh, uh, Andrew. So I'd like to uh, to to announce. Uh, Gerald Michael, congratulations! Gerald uh, won the, uh, the 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 co signed copy of a secret vice today, so uh, I will make sure to um, 
to to get that out to you. Actually, I'm gonna I'll send you an email to ask for your uh, your mailing address and stuff so we can get that out to you. But uh, but thanks so much, and uh, and and thanks thanks again, Andy. Thanks everybody for joining us. Remember that next week, so uh, next Tuesday on Tuesday the 11th, we're going to have uh, Dr. Femi, who's uh, here here with us today and she's going to be speaking next time uh talking about the the it's she's gonna be talking about the phonetic stuff right andy the the essay on phonetic symbolism and sound symbolism yeah 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 that's really great i know several of you were asking questions about that we're really interested in that we'll be you know love to hear more about this is to me one of the most interesting things about uh about tolkien's whole language thing. I was thinking about this a lot during the poetry class that I taught, and we spent so much time listening to the rhythm and the sound of, not, not just, not of Tolkien's invented language, it's just of Tolkien's use of English, right, and the way that he, that he chooses, chooses and balances his words and the incredible phonoesthetic sense that he has just in his use of English in his poetry. Um, and so thinking about that sort of on these, on these kind of deeper levels with the, with the actual phonetics of the language itself, uh, and what he, uh, what he what he uh, uh, does with that too, and Dimitri just said that she's going to do some some stuff on modernism uh, as well, which should be which should be really really neat. So uh, so I hope you guys will be able to join us. You'll yeah. be surprised about who who Tolkien is engaging with there. Yes, it's quite yeah. quite interesting. Dimitri's brilliant yeah. on it. So yes, my, oh, everyone. That's fantastic. Yeah yeah. So so 4 p.m. Eastern time, 9 p.m. Uh, over in the UK on Tuesday the 18th of October, so nine days from now. Thanks again, Andrew. Thanks again, all of you, for joining us. And we hope to see you in just over a week for session two. And thank you so much again for donating. If you haven't gotten a chance to donate yet, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll consider doing that. The, the donation link I gave before will be open still for some time. And we're, we're hoping to raise enough to cover the, the whole year's worth of uh, seminars before long. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank and we'll everyone. see you later. Good night. Good night now. If you enjoyed this seminar, please consider making a small donation to Signum University. Your gift will help us continue to make the seminar series and other great content available for free to the public. Just go to signumuniversity.org slash fund slash donate slash seminars. Thanks!